have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. Traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some anomalistic motion over. Uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or whether any direction it wanted to go. Flag could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. EWA-517, do you want to report a UFO? Over. Negative. We don't want to report. Look, it wasn't my worst Wednesday night. Good evening. I'm your host, Smiles Lewis, and you are listening to a live edition of Anomaly Now, live from Austin, Texas, on this uh, Wednesday, February 8th, 2023. Thank you for joining me. Uh, our co-host Mark Jackson may or may not be joining me at some point uh, this evening, but thank you for tuning in, whether this is uh, live or pre-recorded for you, whether you're watching the YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, Twitter stream, or catching the audio only rebroadcast uh, podcast via Spotify or your favorite podcatcher. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, what do they say? Smash the bell. Sign up for notifications so that you can always be kept in the loop about uh, our next episodes. And uh, this is a weekly news roundup show for the nonprofit 501c3 Anomaly Archive, Scientific Anomaly Institute, located here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we were founded in 2003 as a growing repository for the preservation of materials having to do with the seeking of knowledge in the realm of the anomalous, whether that be uh, consciousness, mind, what is it, uh, parapsychology, the paranormal, whether it be ghost hunting, uh, uh, poltergeists, uh, apparitions, all that sort of thing, or of course our favorite topic, the UFO phenomena, now rebranded as UAP, uh, unidentified aerial phenomena, or as I prefer, unidentified uh, anomalous phenomena, uh, sometimes referred to in my vernacular as UFOs, unassimilated fantastic observations. So last week, uh, we did have to cancel our weekly show. Sorry for uh, promoting that and then not being there for you. But uh, for those of you who are aware of what was sweeping across the United States, we had a massive Arctic blast uh, that came through central Texas and uh, kept moving uh, eastward and making life uh, a little chilly and problematic. We uh, were without power for not quite 24 hours, and uh, that made life a little bit too complicated to try and pull off a live internet streaming broadcast like this. So um, we just rescheduled for uh, the next available time slot, which of course is our Wednesdays here. And again, thank you for joining us. Um, so last week we had, a, a, of course, a few uh, news items that we might get to a little later, but uh, boy, the how strange is it that in 2023, we would be talking about not exactly weather balloons in the case of unidentified mystery objects in the sky, but in this case, alleged surveillance balloons or... Uh, was it just a weather balloon, uh, uh, as the, ch the Chinese were uh, claiming? Yes, we are talking about this supposed China surveillance balloon and uh, three bus-sized package hanging from beneath it that was uh, tracked going across uh, the Canadian-American border into the United States, uh, then hovering for a time over obviously sensitive sites in Montana, such as our nuclear facilities, uh, nuclear uh, warhead missile launching facilities, 
and then moseying its way across the country before finally being shot down just off the coast uh, the east of the eastern seaboard. Now, for those of you who are old hats at the UFO phenomena, and even those of you who are newbies to it, you, you undoubtedly have heard the old joke about, you know, uh, governments and uh, military uh, authorities dismissing UFO sightings as being simply misidentifications of everything from swamp gas to weather balloons. And while uh, it is certainly true that 80 to 90 plus percent of all UFO sightings can inevitably be written off as IFOs, identified flying objects that are often prosaically explained, such as in terms of misidentifications of, uh, of things such as balloons, weather balloons, or satellites and what have you, or even Venus or the moon in some cases. Um, it, it is a little weird uh, it, over the past several years of the rollout of information about the government's UAP, UFO program, OSAP, ATIP, whatever you want to call it, and uh, Lou Elizondo and others' uh, uh, attempts to try and destigmatize the subject of UAPs, move it forward in terms of uh, its accessibility and uh, lifting the ridicule uh, curtain, the laughter factor. Uh, from people's uh, talking about this so that we can actually get down to some real research and maybe some actual progress after the 70 plus years that the modern UFO era has has been going on. Um, but before we go too far into the uh, UFO, the, the, this recent week's uh, UFO incident with the China balloon, um, I did want to uh, promote uh, something that has been announced recently, and that is this uh, Archives of the Impossible 2, eclectic boogaloo, as I'm calling it, uh, transnationalism, transdisciplinary, uh, transcendence. Uh, that is the subtitle for this second edition of the important Rice University Archives of the Impossible, founded by Jeff Kripal there in Houston, Texas. Uh, for those of you who've been following along with this uh, sea change happening in the UFO scene, uh, the, the, the uh, Rice University archives seem to represent the tip of the spear, so to speak, of the sea change happening in academia. Uh, this is an important development, and we are excited to, to see that there is another event already planned. So last March of 2022 was the long-awaited for one or two year delayed uh, grand opening of the Rice University uh, Archives of the Impossible that uh, I and many others participated in. I was honored to be on a panel discussion there talking about archives such as ours here in Austin and those around the country. And now this one here in Texas at, at Rice University in Houston being uh, on the, the cutting edge of trying to preserve this important information. And sure enough, uh, as was mentioned at that event, they had hoped to uh, continue a recurring series of events. And they have now announced that. And you can go to impossiblearchives.rice.edu slash conferences uh, or just impossiblearchives.rice.edu and it'll take you uh, to the conference if you uh, click the right link and scrolling down i think we may oh yes yeah, so there's going to be just like this last year's uh, event there's going to be pre-conferences with webinars uh that folks can attend uh one happening starting in april 19th uh featuring uh gustavo rodriguez Oroca, um and then uh, a week or so later uh yvonne Chiro, i believe is her name uh, we'll be presenting on April 26th and very exciting uh, May 3rd, our friend Joshua Cutchin will be presenting. So you can sign up for any of these uh, virtual pre-webinar events before the main event happening uh, in May. Um, uh, now, and the great thing about uh, this big event, the actual main event happening, oh, I think it's May 11th through 13th is uh, it is going to be just like before, you can go in person or you can sign up and watch uh, remotely, virtually online. Uh, this is of course the new hybrid model and I think it's a great way for uh, increasing accessibility, but there's gonna be a great bunch of folks uh, lined up to speak at this uh, next conference in this ongoing series. And you can find all the information over at the uh, impossiblearchives.rice.edu. 
meanwhile, over uh, at societyforuapstudies.org is this, uh, this past weekend was an all virtual uh, conference. I believe it was all virtual. I don't think it was hybrid. Um, but there's this new organization that's one of many that's springing up now in the wake of the government uh, UA, UAP UFO research uh, revelations. Uh, Society for UAP Studies, advancing the study of unidentified aerospace phenomena through interdisciplinary dialogue. Uh, this looks to be a new, very interesting new organization. They're launching uh, their own uh, journal called Limina, the Journal of UAP Studies. And uh, their founder and editor-in-chief is uh, Michael Christian Sifone uh, from the City University of New York in the Bronx. And uh, excitingly, they're doing their own uh, event uh, coming up. Where is it? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. It was just, just this past weekend. And sadly, I was not able to attend. Uh, still dealing with the, the uh, fallout from the uh, ice storm last week. Um, I didn't finish commenting on that. We were without power. Uh, we took in a friend who uh, was at, without power for more than a couple of days, and uh, eventually we got our power back. And um, but that kept uh, that, recovering from that. The trees were devastated in our neighborhood, and um, they uh, uh, we've just been dealing with that. So I, I was not able to attend this virtual only uh, event put on by the. Uh, uh, Society for UAP Studies, but uh, we'll put links to all this uh, in the show notes, and um, uh, of course, we'll be hopefully finding out more about it. And I'm hoping that they put up the 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 videos of participants uh, either for free or or pay whatever. Uh, but look at this amazing list of of participants. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And uh, there is old Jeff Kripal. Uh, from Rice University, as we were just talking about, and so many other uh, people, including Austin's own Robert Robert Powell from the Society, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, um, that he helped co-found. Mark Rodiger of uh, S uh, Center for UFO Studies, that was founded by uh, J. Allen Hynek back in the day. So great, great lineup, amazing people. Oh, Alexander Went, love his uh, UFO sovereignty article from way back. Good stuff, good stuff. So, um, we'll we'll provide the links. Yeah, you can go check that that out. And uh, we're really just. I think it really does go to show that there is a sea change, as they say, in uh, the the study of of uh, these amazing things. And really uh, looking forward to see where all this goes. Um, now, one th thing we were going to talk about, uh, of course, the, the the big news this week, as mentioned already, is this idea, uh, this <laughs> massive balloon surveilling um, uh, the um, uh, United States, gaining all this attention. Now, honestly, I'm I think a lot of us are just kind of. Uh, with at a loss for words, I, it, it seems h highly improbable that uh, the billion, multi-billion, trillion-dollar military war machine that is the United States defense industry uh, would would be so seemingly inept as to uh, allow this to happen. Let alone um, uh, uh, play as if they were caught off guard. Um, it, it seems uh, pretty clear that this was uh, was known from very early on and as with everything is likely being used uh, in a, as a political football or for political theater. Um, it's also very interesting, of course, to see the politicizing of it, um, not least of which uh, involves, of course, uh, this uh, Republicans blaming Biden for letting suspected Chinese balloon cross into the U.S., uh, let's see, I think we've got that here over at Insider, uh, businessinsider.com, uh, not to be outdone. Um, there's reports that uh, this a, another spy balloon may have crashed off Hawaii uh, four months ago, officials say at least one balloon flew over parts of Texas and Florida during the Trump administration, despite former president saying it never happened. That's, of course, from Fox News. Um, it's, it's just kind of 
it, it's really strange to me to, to see this all playing out like this. Um, really not sure what to make of it. Uh, and of course, there's so many uh, hilarious political cartoons and memes that are being generated by this. But um, one of the things that uh, really interested me was, of course, uh, Canadian UFO researcher Chris Rutkowski, who we've had on this very show uh, a few years ago, uh, when he was talking about reports in the media and how uh, inaccurate they were in talking about the rates of UFO sightings and that sort of thing. And sure enough, he issued a statement over uh, on the UFO Updates Facebook group where he and uh, is a, an admin. And I think this is very telling. Uh, he, of course, says the takeaways from the Chinese recon balloon incident are significant for ufology and UAP studies. First, the public became aware of this when people started posting on social media and phoning media outlets about a UAP in the sky on Thursday afternoon, February 2nd. It was first reported by a witness in Har Harleton, uh, Montana, around 1 p.m., then a report from Reed Point around 2 p.m. More and more reported it, and many people reported it over billings around 4 or 5 p.m., Another report came from Hobson, Montana. Media started getting uh, experts to comment for the uh, suppertime news, but by 6 p.m., the Pentagon stated to CNN and other news outlets that they were tracking a Chinese surveillance balloon. So while most people were unaware, the balloon was identified and being monitored by the U.S. Space Force and NORAD. The track from the NOA clearly showed its progress from China across Alaska, then British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan before it was slowed and onward, before it was slowed and onboard systems allowed it to remain in place over U.S. nuclear sites in Montana. So citizen observations of a UAP, quote unquote, were useful in alerting the public, but also certainly provided the Pentagon with supplemental data on the balloon's movement. Therefore, human and uninstrumented observations of UAP do have value in UAP research. Also, media contacted UFO UAP researchers early on for their opinion and, and comments on the object seen over Montana before the Pentagon revealed what it was. If defense officials had alerted UAP researchers earlier, they could have re reassured the public as well. But this also shows that when an object is seen in the sky, especially by dozens of witnesses, it means there actually was an object in the sky. It was not a mass hallucination. When UAP reports are filed with ufologists, there were, for the most part, objects seen that initially baffled the observers. If a Chinese reconnaissance balloon is flying over the USA to test American defenses, monitor nuclear facilities, and eavesdrop uh, on cell phone conversations, now there's an idea, it is not unreasonable to suggest that smaller Chinese devices or craft could be buzzing around U.S. Navy testing and training facilities off Catalina, or of course, referring to the infamous UAP videos, uh, the Navy videos re released as part of the To the Stars Academy uh, efforts, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and all their efforts. Again, I, I just uh, think Chris, uh, while he is a very much a skeptic, he, that, that actually makes him uh, well, uh, well nigh a good researcher uh, to, to comment on this sort of stuff, so. Um, another, um, article, uh, you know, I just thinking about the context of this, um, it, it, I find it significant that, uh, here we are, you know, in 2023 talking about this and, uh, balloons besides the infamous, uh, claim that, that Roswell was first a weather balloon. Uh, and then later a described as a, a, a project mogul balloon, which was a high altitude electromagnetically uh, oriented balloon uh, assembly to monitor uh, Soviet nuclear weapons testing. Um, there later in the history of UFO research and ufology and the re researchers themselves came several ideas that are often poo-pooed uh, by believers and even skeptics uh, alike. And one of those earliest ideas was put forth by uh, one of my favorite UFO researchers, John Keel. Uh, John Keel, of course, um, uh, was famous for a lot of things, his book, The Mothman Prophecies, and um, 
uh, he put forth an idea uh, about the Roswell uh, crash possibly being the result of a Fugo balloon. And the Fugo balloons were um, uh, a, a Japanese balloon bomb assembly where uh, the Japanese had these massive uh, balloons that with explosives on the bottom that they would float up via the jet stream over to North America. And uh, this was kept secret from the American public for a long time. There were a few uh, that came down and, in fact, I think injured some people, but it was covered up because they didn't want to cause a scare or give any uh, aid and comfort to the enemy by letting them know that, yes, indeed, they'd been su successful. Of course, this was all pre-satellite technology, and uh, so there wouldn't be as, as e many easy ways to track that sort of thing. But um, but Keel was, was one to put forth this idea he mixed up the idea in very strange ways by describing uh, the possibility that there was um, uh, a, a a monkey on board and that this um, that there was a monkey on board and that um, uh, the descriptions of alien bodies might have been somehow connected to that. And most people just laughed and thought this is the most ridiculous thing ever. First of all, because of the, the number of years between the end of the war, World War II, with the, with, against the Germans and uh, the other Axis powers uh, and Japan specifically. Uh, and so how could this balloon have been kept aloft so long if, if that's what this was? Or was it sent somehow away after the end of the war? Uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But years later, of course, uh, researcher uh, extraordinaire Nick Redfern would come out with a book called Body Snatchers in the Desert, in which he assembled all the weird data points that he was coming across for years that had to do with um, this idea that, uh, well, the, the, the overall, the, the idea that he puts forth in the book body snatchers in the desert which he is very quick to say is not necessarily what he believes to be true but is what he is reporting in the book as far as the data that has been presented to him via all these different uh, seemingly unrelated sources that all seem to gel into a tapestry that i personally find very compelling uh, as an explanation as one possible explanation for what happened with roswell and that basically is that just like uh with the german nazi uh, uh human experimentation program that was led by uh, uh mingala uh where all sorts of horrible things were done to uh human subjects uh including the testing of, of live human subjects uh, in, in ice cold water uh, or high altitude using high altitude balloons to see the effects of these uh, stresses on these uh, poor human victims. Um, there was a similar program under an organization called Unit 731, if I'm getting the number right, uh, in, uh, under the, uh, the Japanese um, uh, Axis powers. And it is alleged, and, and I, I believe this has all been confirmed, that just like with Pro Project Paperclip, whereby uh, the, the Nazis, uh, after we won the war, Nazis were imported into the United States and seeded throughout the uh, United States college system and research institutes uh, under the, uh, the auspice of the CIA and others. And this is what led to such things as CIA and uh, Project MK Ultra, but much, much other uh, things. I mean, we're talking, I believe, thousands of, of, um, of Nazis were imported and allowed to continue their work. Well, similarly, supposedly, uh, members of Unit 731 were similarly brought over from Japan. But <clears throat> worse still, excuse me, Worse still was the uh, alleged bringing over of some of their test subjects. Uh, and these test subjects tended to be uh, people with disabilities, people who had been disappeared uh, for various reasons as, as people that would not be missed, that sort of thing. And the allegation uh, floated by sources of Nick Redfern's that he published in that book, Body Snatchers in the Desert, is this idea that the uh, these 
these victims were brought over with the researchers and the research was allowed to continue and that what was actually downed in Roswell and discovered by uh, local witnesses was in fact the result of one of these combination of uh, uh, German flying wing Horton brothers type flying wing technology that was susp supposedly suspended under one of these balloons and that they were using these uh, disabled human experiment victims as uh, experimentees and that what people saw were probably uh, uh, people with things like progeria or other types of disabilities. Now, this is a horrific uh, a scenario and my gosh, can you imagine if it were ever proven, what would Roswell, New Mexico's reaction be now that this is like their main tourism uh, 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 money-making machine? The idea of crashed aliens. Well, well what if it was turn, turned out to actually be uh, a, a that was the cover story for something much, much worse. Who knows? Now, years later, uh, or within a few years of, of Nick Redfern's book, uh, a more prominent uh, mainstream journalist, Annie Jacobson, came out with her massive, really thick book about the history of Area 51. And one of the things that got the most attention was not the pretty well verified history uh, of, of the, the uh, mystery airbase, but in fact, uh, somebody, one of her sources coming forward with a similar to Redfern's story, uh, Redfern's uh, uh, hypothesis put forth uh, um, in Body Snatchers in the Desert, but a, with the twist that it wasn't, it was, it was those dang Soviets that uh, Stalin uh, had worked with Mengele to create chimera fake aliens and that they had somehow flown some sort of aircraft into the United States and deliberately crashed it. Uh, and this was to create a kind of a war of the world type scenario, a, 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 uh, uh, a false uh, fake alien invasion or, uh, and, and, and induce fear or whatever cause a panic or what have you. Um, again, many people have poo pooed that and focused on that and to, to, to the, and disregarded everything else in her book. Uh, because of course it is the most sensational idea in the book compared to just, Oh wow. That's where they did secret aviation tests. So, um, I found all of this very fascinating. Of course, um, nowadays, uh, the project mogul explanation is, uh, the, the, uh, skeptical debunked debunking idea for what happened in Roswell. If you do a search for mogul Roswell, you'll find all the mainstream sources that, uh, put forth this idea that yes, that, that is exactly what happened in Roswell. It was just this mogul balloon, but, the whole point of the testimony of the Roswell witnesses is this idea that um, they were Mac Brazel for is the person credited with whose land uh, the wreckage was found on and who turned it into the military. Well, he was used to turning in weather balloon uh, material. And I think there was like a standard reward. And this, this happened on such a regular basis that Brazel would have been very familiar with, uh, traditional, um, um, balloon technology. And so the stories of the, uh, strange aspects of the meta materials or what have you, the, the, the wreckage would be much more, uh, unlikely, if this was just a, a, a weather balloon or even a project mogul balloon, it, it seems highly unlikely that the technology being employed in the mogul balloon would have been so advanced as to be that different from a weather balloon that Brazel would have already been familiar with. So it doesn't really sit well with me as a, as a probable explanation, but um, there you go. Um, so, there are all these different uh, uh, balloon aspects to um, this 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 current spat of news uh, this past week involving this uh, alleged Chinese surveillance balloon, and and I don't doubt that it could and probably is in fact what the the military industrial complex is describing as a surveillance balloon. Um, however, it is uh, the fact is that. Um, 
besides the context of the UFO balloon context that we just went over, um, let's not forget that uh, uh, we'll post links to these articles from the past several years. Back in 2015, um, uh, the let's see if I can pull this up here. Uh, back in 2015, the Baltimore Sun re reported uh, balloon escape is latest problem for troubled army program. So yes, no surprise there. The, the military has been using balloons obviously for a long time. We use them regularly for border patrol as surveillance platforms. Um, and then there are these other incidents uh, back in uh, 2019. Uh, here's the Guardian Pentagon testing mass surveillance balloons across the U.S. So, yeah, uh, we were talking about and I think doing the exact same thing that perhaps the Chinese are being alleged to have done to us. Uh, so let's monitor our own people. Now, uh, this isn't trying to be a political program here, but it just gives you some context to this latest round of government claims of Chinese surveillance of the American people. Um, and then there's. Uh, some very interesting uh, stuff. Let's see if this is going Today, to mankind embarks on its most exciting adventure. I don't adventure, know if I've got the conquest the audio. of space. Hold on a second here. Raven. Well. Let's see here. I'm going to try to share this one more time here. Uh, share screen. I think I've got the audio turned on. Is it working? Well, I'm not. Oh, here we go. The conquest of space and the role of the balloon. I don't think it's playing. Has been I don't think very you can hear important. that sound. Anyway, uh, Raven this Aerostar is, uh, is a world leader ago, in the design, Raven development, Aerostar and manufacture of aerospace products. One of the balloons We've been challenging the limit. Uh, well, balloon know, systems allow for rapid integration of diverse payloads and sensors, about, uh, serving a wide name, range of missions. Uh, everything. And it's 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 pretty amazing. Uh, this is the exact same kind of like controllable from satellite type technology. Uh, for a balloon to make it be able to hover over sites that you want to be, uh, that you want observed, um, just like what we've been seeing in the claims about this Chinese balloon. So again, uh, just, just another day uh, in the <laughs> militarily funded uh, high altitude balloon uh, arena. Um, there was another, let's see, here's... Um, uh, NOAA research. This is from research.noaa.gov. Teaming up with Arizona firm to advance study of stratosphere. And there's your uh, track for one of these balloons. Anyway, these are, you know, just further examples of the context of what we're, we're talking about. Um, and also this, this one, interesting. We've, we've, uh, re we've repeatedly cited the drive dot com uh, in in our uh, new shows here and this one uh, from um, uh, 2021 what we know about the high altitude balloons recently lingering off America's coastlines and this gets into exactly uh, the same kinds of uh, allegations about balloons uh, and links to some of those same videos that we were just showing as far as the American version of that well uh, we're going to try to keep this short tonight uh, that is uh, pretty much the extent of what I wanted to talk to you all about with regard to this silly balloon incident. Um, I know it's not near as fun as some of the uh, other news that we often cover here on uh, Anomaly Now, but uh, we, you know, look forward to launching some new interview series real soon, some some roundtable panel discussions. Uh, we're going to be expanding all kinds of content creation for material uh, on behalf of the 501c3 Anomaly Archives who host this show. And you can find out so much more about the Anomaly Archives by going to our website, A-N-O-M-A-L-Y archives.org. And I am uh, Smiles Lewis, and we will see you again next week. Thank you for joining us and good night. Mm -hmm.